Okay, we're back for the second half hour. I'm going to continue on a bit here before I get into Walter Weiss. He's going to talk a little bit about how the United States fits into the big picture of the Vatican-led New World Order's plans for a one-world government, one-world religion. We'll get to that in a moment. But as I was saying, this whole idea of Trump being selected and what's going on in our political system is a perfect example of how this theater and the Hegelian dialectic operates. Of course, we have nothing but America being split. We're seeing the racial divisions even come back like they were before Martin Luther King. We're seeing the country being torn between uh, America, the conservative uh, ideals, and also now the new communistic uh, uh, Democratic Party, Socialistic Democratic Party, and both of these groups fighting a battle of words on Washington, in Washington, D.C., in a battle of uh, using, uh, let's say, the FBI and using the Justice Department as an example of how this country is going to rise. So we have, and how is Trump, I'm going to end it right here because I'll talk about this tomorrow again. How do I know Trump is a plant? Very simple. He's allowing his Justice Department, he put in an attorney general who's doing nothing, and he's allowing his Justice Department to create this atmosphere and the FBI that everything in his campaign was being colluded with Russia and he shouldn't be there and they're investigating these things while at the same time he could just stop the whole thing or if he had an attorney general that was really for real that this investigation will get stopped and then you'd go after the real criminals in the Clinton side of this in the Democratic side but they're being allowed to go scot-free allowing the American people to just look at this and go how could this be our system is broken that's exactly what they want so you can catch a lot of this both sides of this Hegelian dialectic if you listen to Fox News or you listen to CNN and you'll get my drift but I'll come back and talk a little bit uh, more in depth on this tomorrow on Friday but let me get to Vyth again here as he talks a little bit about the Trump card Okay, let me get to him right now. Get to the United States of America. One of the most loved presidents of all time was this man, JFK, John F. Kennedy. And John F. Kennedy was a Catholic, and you would expect this Roman Catholic to take a Catholic position, but he didn't. He took a Protestant position. And he made a speech which so irked the powers that be that maybe it led to his demise. Whether it did or not, that's not the subject of this evening. He said the following, and he said it with such pathos. He said, I believe in an America where the separation of church and state is absolute where no Catholic prelate would tell the president, should he be Catholic, how to act, and no Protestant minister would tell his parishioners for whom to vote, where no church or church school is granted any public funds or political preference, and where no man is denied public office merely because his religion differs from the president who might appoint him or the people who might elect him. I believe in an America that is officially neither Catholic, Protestant, nor Jewish, when no public official either requests or accepts instructions on public policy from the Pope, the National Council of Churches, or any other ecclesiastical source, when no religious body seeks to impose its will directly or indirectly upon the general populace or the public acts of its officials, and where religious liberty is so indivisible and an act against one church is treated as an act against all. Ah, isn't that beautiful? Freedom of conscience. You can decide what you want to believe, and nobody is allowed to tell you what to believe. That is freedom of religion. Church and state separate. The Bible tells me that this will cease to exist. 
that they will make an image to the first beast, church and state will come together and they will enforce their dictates. That's what the Bible says. It sounds impossible. Remember this speech. In the book Tragedy and Hope, which is uh, a rather interesting one, uh, Carol Quigley, who was Bill Clinton's mentor, and Carol, Carol Quigley, by the way, is, was a professor at Georgetown University, the Jesuit University. And by the way, historically, do you know why the Jesuits were created, why they came into existence? They came into existence to deal with a specific crisis of which you were a part. In fact, the crisis was Protestantism. And their aim was to destroy Protestantism. And the present Pope is a Jesuit. Now, you might believe that Rome has changed and that uh, it doesn't reflect the image of the Middle Ages anymore, but uh, we will have to look into that into some detail, and that's why I don't want you to miss the next lectures. Now, this man said something very interesting as well. He also said that the world is ruled by a very small, powerful elite of which he is a member. That was a fascinating statement. The world is ruled by a very powerful elite of which he is a member? Well, what was he? He was a Jesuit. Is he trying to say that the Jesuits control what people think and do? Leave it at that. He also said, the argument of two parties, that's political parties, should represent opposed ideas and policies, one perhaps of the right and the other of the left, is a foolish idea acceptable only to doctrinate and academic thinkers. Instead, the two parties should be almost identical so that the American people can throw the rascals out at any election without leading to any profound or extensive shifts in policy. The policies that are vital and necessary for America are no longer subject of significant disagreement but are disputable only in details of procedure, priority or method. So he's saying basically that whether you vote for the party in red or the party in blue doesn't make any difference. You're wasting your time. Basically, that's what he's saying. Now, there's another component that's very interesting, and that is how to channel the mindset of people into a particular direction, that they all start thinking the same way. And this has been done politically over eons, and it works every time. And that's called the Hegelian dialectic. Hegel was a philosopher who thought these things up, or gave it a name at least. And that is what we have there in the two political parties represented there. So what is a Hegelian dialectic? It's a framework for guiding thoughts and actions into conflicts that lead to synthetic solutions which can only be introduced once those being manipulated take a side that will advance the predetermined agenda. Brilliant. Brilliant. Controlled opposition, problem, reaction, solution. That is how the Hegelian dialectic works. So let's say I wanted to change your mindset so that you would return and cling to your Christianity whether you believe it or not. Then I must create a threat which seems greater to you than clinging to your atheism or whatever. And I must herd you into this idea. I must get rid of this threat. That which I had was better than that which I have now. I'm going to think like this. That would be one way to herd people. Now, here's Obama. <laughs> <laughs> humorous. <laughs> He's the one who says Trump That's is enough. not fit to serve as president, and many are singing that tune. But uh, here yeah, you can see the American flag in no. tatters, Iraq no. disaster, the rise of ISIS, weak border no. security, race relations at an all-time low, the Obama-Hillary legacy, uh, all of the issues mm -hmm. of morality that seem to have gone down the tube to such an extent 
that chaos breaks out. Now, if the chaos starts exceeding... You see what happens? You start talking about chaos, and the dogs create their own Hegelian dialectic here, one trying to take the milk bone from the other. And I solved that problem quick. ...eating a certain boundary, then people will be herded into nets of safety. Are you with me? Now, this was being done. Whether it is being done deliberately or not is neither here nor there. I believe it's being done largely deliberately, but you don't have to believe that if you don't want to. And this man said, the future must not belong to those who slander the prophet Islam. Now that scared the wits out of many people in the United States of America because they were seeing themselves already under Sharia law. <laughs> and uh, that scares people. So herding people in a direction. And then the loss of morality in the world. The White House lit up with rainbow of the same sex marriage ruling. It just seemed to such a large proportion of the populace that the values that they grew up with seemed to be going down the drain. And that hurts people into a collective mindset. Now what does the Bible say is going to happen to the United States? Is there going to be a mindset, yes or no? Yes. What is that mindset? The mindset that there is one set of morality and that if people don't accept that morality, then they don't have a right to exist. Are we heading that way? Is there going to be a pendulum swing from absolute liberalism to absolute authoritarian conservatism? Is that possible? It seems to me mankind just doesn't have the capacity to make the pendulum stop in the middle. Once it's swung to one side and you let it go, it inevitably swings to the other side. And there are forces which will force it in that direction. Strange that at the same time while endorsing the Prophet Muhammad, he will also endorse the legacy of Pope Francis. And he will say that this is the man that we should follow. And even more fascinating, that he gave him the same stature and above and above that, that he gave to any incumbent president or incoming president. Because when Pope Francis visited the United States, he followed the exact same sequence as one who actually becomes a president. First went to the White House, was received with great pomp. Then he went to the Capitol, spoke to both houses of the government, made a speech in which he very cleverly cited certain individuals which stood for certain ideologies, planting a seed that these ideologies should become part and parcel of any system of governance. And when that speech was over, not like a normal president, new president who will go out the bottom doors and be greeted by the populace, he went out on the balcony which means he's over and above what a president stands for and was greeted by the populace, as you can see here. So from there, he went to the United Nations and became the first pope to speak to the world leaders at the United Nations. Now you'll say to me, that's not true. Many popes spoke at the United Nations, true. But they never spoke to the world leaders. They only spoke to the diplomats, to the representatives. But here was the 70th anniversary, and all the world leaders were there. And this man proceeded from this inauguration to speak to the entire world leadership. Fascinating. We don't have time to go into that. There's another. So, Mr. Veith has proved again. And I've said this myself on shows when we go over the same things that when the Pope came here, that he was sh given he was given a audience in our in our Senate in our Congress. He was then given an audience above 
given a stature above even the President of the United States, and then he proceeded to the United Nations to speak to all the world leaders as the number one man. So he has basically shown to you right there, when we say that the Vatican is controlled, is in control of this new world order, using the Jesuit order as their main assassins and spies and strategists, we're not making this up. And that showed you exactly in the way they think, in the way they present it to us, why we, when we say the Vatican-led New World Order here is the truth. Now, it'll be played to the American people that he's a humble, pious man, and so he's given that podium, but it's for a very different reason. The lecture on what he said and what it means. And then these two ideologies, the pendulum swing from the left to the pendulum swing on the right, came into conflict. And it was a better conflict with many, many harsh words spoken. And people chose sides. But when it came to the Red Meal, they were quite cheerfully sitting on either side of the representative of the Knights of Malta, the highest Knight of Malta in the United States of America, the Cardinal of New York, Cardinal Dolan. And uh, he was also the man who did the prayer at the inauguration of the new president. So these are strange issues where these parties come together and talk. And they are very cheerful, but very acrimonious when it comes to talking about each other. Now, just for interest's sake, not that it has any particular relevance, but just for interest's sake, as it turns out, both Trump and Hillary Clinton are related to John Gaunt, a 14th century royal. So they have royal lineage. Trump is related through his mother Mary Ann McLeod back to the 17th great-grandfather John Beaufort etc etc and the Clintons and the, all of these were all related and if you look at the American presidential bloodlines you'll see did you know that all 44 US presidents have carried European royal bloodlines into office? 34 have been genetic descendants of just one person Charlemagne the brutal 8th century king of the Franks. Now I find that interesting that they're all descendants of basically one man who was the first one to be crowned emperor of the Holy Roman Empire under Rome. Just an interesting fact. Could be pure coincidence. 19 of them directly descended from King Edward III of England. Well, just an interesting fact. Also interesting is that uh, the little cartoon, The Simpsons, predicted a President Trump presidency. Now, it's also interesting that this same little cartoon managed to predict so many other things so accurately, so many years in advance. It's almost as if they have a prophetic line. But be that as it may, I'll just show you some pictures. This, mag this little cartoon is, of course, very heavily steeped in occultism with all the Illuminati symbolism and all of this stuff in it. Let's not even go there. But uh, I find it interesting that they, in the year 2000, which is 17 or 16 years before this election, showed uh, the candidate which not only had the same clothes on and the same beads and the same colored dress, but uh, representing, of course, Hillary Clinton. And I find that rather fascinating. And they got it pretty right and accurate with Donald Trump as well. There's their cartoon of the year 2000. He's even got the same clothes on. They're pretty good, right? I think they're clairvoyants or something. Or else they know something we don't know. And uh, this also 
Oh no, it couldn't be true. Surely this didn't happen to us. Well, be that as it may, I'm not interested in going into those details. Let's not be conspiratorial, uh, which is a word that many people are very allergic to. Let's stick to the facts. Let's just look at what is happening. Five faith facts on Mike Pence, a born-again evangelical Catholic. Now, do you know what an oxymoron is? An oxymoron is a contradiction in terms. Now, if there ever was a contradiction on, in terms, then it is an evangelical Catholic. It's impossible. You're either an evangelical or you're a Catholic, but you can't be an evangelical Catholic unless there has been some kind of marriage that uh, is strange, to say the least. But that is where we're heading to. That's where the Hegelian mindset has to take humanity, because that divide between Catholicism and Protestantism has to go. And uh, Mike Pence, postmodern evangelical Catholic conservative. That's the running mate and the vice president. The Washington Post says, yes, Donald Trump really went to an Ivy League school. I'd like to know where was he educated. And it tells us where he was educated. And I think we can trust the Washington Post there. And it says, first he went to a private school, then he went to military school, and then he went to Fordham University, a Jesuit school. So he was trained in a Jesuit institution, which doesn't mean very much. Most people, many people are trained there. And then he went to the University of Pennsylvania, and that is also a Catholic-run institution, which is not directly Jesuit, but indirectly Jesuit. It's also interesting that his, some of his children are trained, or were trained, at Georgetown University, which is a Jesuit institute. So he is associated with Jesuit institutes. Now what about Mike T. Pence? Mike Pence is also very much a creation of the last half century of American political religious life. Did you notice that? Political religious life, something which should be totally what? Separate. Born and raised Catholic, he became a Catholic youth minister, reportedly wanted to be a priest. So this is a very serious Catholic. And then he began blending his Catholicism with evangelical Protestantism, and I made a commitment to Christ. I'm born again evangelical Catholic. Now, I'm not denying his, his credentials. I'm just saying that theologically, this is a misnomer. But uh, let's look at the other side. His counterpart was Tim Kaine. So if Hillary had come in, then the vice president would have been Tim Kaine. I wonder where he was trained. Well, let's have a look. This is Harvard Divinity School. I think that's a reputable source, don't you think? What do they say? Kaine was educated at a Jesuit high school and has been influenced throughout his life by Jesuits. Often seen as progressive and open-minded in the U.S., he also has been called Pope Francis Catholic. What does it mean to be a liberal Catholic reformer? Okay, i got to break it off there. We'll come back tomorrow talk a little bit more about the Trump card and uh, maybe finish up here with Walter Vyth back on the Investigative Journal. Have a good evening and see you tomorrow on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Back tomorrow.